Thank you for joining me today for a walk in the garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this show on Norfolk Community Cable Television is filmed throughout the year in my garden here in Norfolk. We had a very extended fall with warm temperatures throughout October, but when it came, it came hard, and November has proved to be really cold, and fall finally came, or dare I say winter, with some freezing temperatures, and the ground is actually a little hard at times when the temperature goes down. It's been below freezing pretty much every night for the last week. After having higher temperatures two weeks ago, we were in the 70s one day, and now we're in the 30s. I discovered, as when I cleaned up the garden, I always have cold hands, and I discovered something, and one is uh, these little gloves that are a dollar, even mine have some holes in them, but dollar gloves, they're tight, and they do fit inside the garden gloves. It's a tight fit, but it gives uh, some finger mobility, and it keeps the hands warm and dry, which is the main thing when you're cleaning up and it's been raining. You need to keep uh, your hands dry and warm, and this has worked really well for me. I never thought about putting the two together but it's worked nicely. I'm in my herb garden, and it's ready for winter. You'll notice there are oak leaves all over it. I did remove some of the maple leaves that were on it, but the oak leaves don't mat down like maple leaves do, and they are a pretty good mulch, so I'll leave those. All the annual plants have been taken out, and I've left things like sage, which can still be picked, thyme, that can also be picked. I've also left the southern woods, and lavenders, which I won't prune those until spring. They seem to do better without pruning until spring. All of the things in here are quite hardy. Uh, rue is another one that I've left. Some of the mint's been trimmed, some of it hasn't. I've trimmed back oregano and tarragon, and some of the mint, and some of the lemon and lime balm plants, uh, and pulled out all the annual plants. We had basil, and some parsley. One parsley's left because it may just come up again next spring. I'll leave these oak leaves on here until spring and then come out and take them off as the things start to sprout again. Uh, and they will. Uh, we can continue as long as it isn't covered with snow, picking sage and thyme at least, and uh, using those in the kitchen. I've also dried the sage and thyme so I'll have those in case we're covered with snow. Now let's move on over to the perennial garden. I've been doing a lot of things there. In the perennial garden, I've been cutting back some of the perennials, uh, those that are particularly messy in the spring, which would include most of the iris and daylilies. The, the foliage gets kind of uh, gummy and is harder to remove in the spring. I've left the oak leaves again. On the lawn, we have used the lawnmower to crunch up the leaves and taken them off the lawn. Normally, we mow the leaves. Some of them get mowed right onto the lawn and provide some fertilizer for the lawn. We don't use much fertilizer on the lawn, depending instead on grass clippings and leaves that are left on the lawn, mulched into the lawn. But the leaves are a little too heavy to leave them all winter as mulch, so we do remove some of them and that mulch I've piled up in the vegetable garden, and that will be taken to some of the other gardens, particularly my shade gardens in back, and used as mulch. I've been taking out my plant uh, supports. As you recall, I use uh, cut up tomato cages to support a lot of my perennials, and these are ready to go and be put away, usually near my potting table, and they'll be gone for the winter. You may have noticed uh, in the herb garden, I have a large uh, container of, uh, actually a garden cart full of sticks. Uh, we, as winter came or fall came, whichever you wish to call it, uh, a lot of sticks came down. We had a couple really windy days and all of the trees dropped branches. So another job I've been doing quite a bit of is picking up sticks, trying to stay ahead of them for winter. And that'll be added to my wagon. I have a couple of tender perennials. This Flomus is one of them. It's a nice uh, yellow plant in the spring, but it is uh, a little tender. So I'm gonna add some straw to that one. 
and just uh, lightly mulch it. If it had, if I could depend on uh, snow cover for the winter, the plant would probably survive. But here we may have cold without snow. Therefore, uh, something that's tender may not make it. Uh, they tend to dry out when it's uh, cold without any snow cover. Snow is a great insulator, as are oak leaves. So we're using those in several ways. I left some of the things standing. I left the asters, fall asters. They could be cut down, but I did leave them. You'll notice the poppy has put up foliage here in the fall, and that's completely normal. Uh, it will come back again in the spring, and we'll have some blooms then. Again, the iris has all been cut down, and some of the other plants left. Lavender, again, I don't prune until spring, but some of my lavenders are in pretty exposed spots for the wind, north wind coming in. So I will cover those, and I've, I use for uh, the lavenders and chrysanthemums that I want to keep, bushel baskets, or any kind of basket really, filled with oak leaves. And I'll just uh, put it over this foliage. The oak leaves are in there not too tightly. And then I put a rock on top. It may not be the most beautiful, but I've had really good luck with keeping my uh, lavenders in the, through the winter. Again, with snow cover, they'd probably be okay, but sometimes we don't have much snow until January or February, and we do have cold. The other thing that I do with my roses is to, I've got buckets of compost, and I'm going to, on each rose around the bottom, put about a half a bucket of compost. This will keep the root area, the area where the stems attach, and it goes into the roots, especially if there's a graft on the rose. It will protect that a little bit from drying out from the wind and from the cold. Each rose will get this treatment, and then in the spring, we'll just pull it away, and it will provide fertilizer for the rose as well. Some of the things like the uh, Sedum Autumn Joy, I leave because they add some winter interest and they do look really pretty if they have a little snow on them. They can also be picked and used in winter containers. I usually fill my uh, flower pots that are left out with evergreens and I can use these in those containers and they add a little interest and they can also be sprayed. You can spray them gold or silver or red or blue or whatever color you want and they add a little color to the containers as well, or you can just leave them natural. I kind of prefer the natural ones. Hopefully that we things are well hydrated here and uh, we can go through winter. This is a fairly new little evergreen, and if we get a dry spell, I will probably water that if it warms up a little bit and we get a dry spell, because I did just put it in. Another thing I'll put straw on are any plants that I put in this year. I have a gas plant back here, and I'll probably add a little straw cover to that. I'm not sure how hardy it is, and I know it's been planted recently, so mulching it with a little something would probably benefit it. Again, I've cut back a Siberian iris, another one that's messy and takes up a lot of space. Uh, we have red twig dogwood here, and this benefits by pruning because the red stems are what you want for winter interest. But they can also be used in arrangements. And these two can be cut. And it's best if you can take about a third off every year. Last year I pruned it all the way down because I hadn't taken any off for a while. But if you could put uh, about a third of the stems out of it. And again, we'll add these to some of the winter pots. I leave some of my big plastic pots out. Uh, if you have ceramic or terracotta pots, you don't want to leave them out because they will get wet, freeze, and crack. Plastic pots seem to be a little more resilient, and you can leave those out all winter. And they can uh, form the basis of some nice winter decorations. We'll do that in December. Again, I've got a big chrysanthemum here and I have not cut it back. I won't cut those back until spring either. 
but I will kind of fold the foliage in. And again, put one of my leafy baskets over the top of it and tuck the foliage underneath and put a rock on top. The chrysanthemums also have a basal foliage. There's a new foliage coming up at the base of the plant and that's just what you want to have it come back next year. If you've put in your uh, chrysanthemums in the fall, it's highly unlikely unless we have an extremely mild winter and it doesn't seem to be starting out that way that they'll come back. Uh, they're sold primarily for the just for use in the fall as decorative mums. They call them hardy mums, but they really aren't if you buy them in the fall. However, if you really want chrysanthemums that'll come back, you need to buy them in the spring. And the only way to get them then pretty much is to order them through some of the garden catalogs. They come very small, but they develop very quickly. And you'll have mums in the fall in bloom and they'll stay for years to come with some protective care in the winter. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden. We still have a little harvest. During the windstorm, a number of pine boughs came down, so I started a little early filling my containers uh, where the annuals had been. Actually, there's still a snapdragon in this pot and it's still green. It may come back next spring, so I'm just gonna leave that one. The ivy too may come back and it looks nice with the pine. I also put an old piece of driftwood, or not driftwood, but wood. I thought it was an interesting branch, and I'll see how I can add that to my decorations. I'm gonna add these uh, red twig dogwood stems that we put in, and I'll keep adding to this, which brings me to holly. And I have several holly bushes, which I can use, but I'd like to make sure they're still there when I go to cut my holly and my berries. Deer like them. And so I want to make sure that I uh, keep them sprayed. I'll definitely let the odor wear off before I bring them inside. But this uh, bush was almost entirely eaten three or four years ago, not realizing that deer would eat it I certainly wouldn't want to eat it. It's kind of prickly, but uh, they seem to like it. So you want to make sure that you do spray any holly you have. And also uh, they uh, like azaleas. And this is an azalea. And I'll give that a spray. Spray will last quite a long time, but you want to make sure you get, get it at deer face height. They'll reach down a little bit, but they particularly like things convenient. So they can climb right up here and have a good bite. And azaleas, uh, young rhododendrons, they bother, but they don't seem to bother my mo more mature rhododendrons. Some people have trouble with their evergreens. And again, you'll want to spray those if you've had any trouble with the deer snacking on them. Okay, we're in the vegetable garden and it's kind of the last call on harvest. I've got a bunch of arugula here and I could probably still pick a little bit for salad. I could pick a lot more if I had gotten out here before the frost warning and freeze warning and covered it with uh, some plastic uh, and perhaps some hoops. I didn't, so it will probably go for the winter. It's starting to look a little wilty. But I do have some scallions to pick. And I need to get those out of the ground. And we can use those. And we can leave a few maybe for next spring and they'll come up again when spring comes. But you do need to fork under it with the ground getting a little more solid. But we have some nice scallions. These are from the seeds that I put in earlier this winter. The other thing I need to pick to use would be the leeks. We picked one last time, but they really get sweeter after they've had a frost. So the rest of them will come out now. And again, we'll use those. 
cut off the tops and the roots, and I can save those in the refrigerator. Or if I had a cooler spot, like a cellar, they would last quite a long time. I don't have too many of them, so we'll probably just enjoy them sooner rather than later. This is a nice one. This is uh, what they should be. Some of them are smaller, but this is a pretty good one. This year I uh, planted them in pretty much pure compost and it paid off. And then I uh, filled in the trench with compost as well. Another good one. The garlic that we planted last month is right here. And I have it marked so that it will not get rototilled. And we have a string on it, and I've also put straw over it. And that will be here for us uh, next spring. We'll see some of the shoots come up. I have kale, and I have some that I will continue harvesting. This was a later planting. And this one I'm going to mulch with straw and hopes that we get kale coming up next spring. So we'll just put some straw over that as a mulch and see if uh, perhaps some of it will come up next spring. Again, here's the kale that I'm still picking. Uh, it's still putting out some nice green shoots. It's amazing because all of the cabbage butterflies are now gone. So we have lovely kale without any holes in it. Uh, it's sweeter after a frost. So uh, this is a great time to harvest some of the kale. You can freeze it. Uh, it'll keep in the refrigerator for quite a long time too. So I'll be picking this until the snow flies, probably. Over here I have parsnips. And it's time to pick those too. And again, we need to loosen up the soil to get those parsnips out of the soil. And uh, we have some that are small and some that are larger. These are excellent roasted. If you've never liked parsnips boiled, which I don't think I do either, try roasting them. They come out really sweet and delicious. Uh, they're an excellent, excellent thing. And roasting really brings out a nice flavor. Again, you have to really get under these parsnips to get them out, to get the whole root. And these I will wash. And again, these will keep in, the, in cold storage for a while. Take off most of the foliage and keep them washed up. Over here I have parsley. And I've been picking it and using it. And I'm going to uh, put a little mulch on that too of straw. I have straw left, and we could also use uh, some of my pile of clippings. But I will uh, get more straw out and cover some of these, and hopefully, again, next spring, it will come up and we'll have an early uh, parsley harvest. Parsley is a biennial. It comes up from seed the first year and forms leaves. And the second year that it comes up, it forms a bloom stalk. It will bloom and then it will die. So what happens is you can have parsley pretty much all season. If you leave your parsley in, now harvest in the spring and, what you, and plant in the spring and what you've planted will be good later in the season after the second year plants have finished their blooming and uh, have died. So. You can continue to have parsley for much longer season if you leave the plants in place. Now I'm going to go over to the uh, area where I had some dahlias and canna lilies. And I did dig these the other day because the temperature got down to about 19. What you want is for the foliage to all frost. And this is the dahlia. You can see it really put on a lot of there's a lot of starts on this dahlia, a lot of root. Uh, some of them will discard, they're dried out. They definitely are not gonna grow next year. But uh, what I need to do with this is, 
I've got some boxes with peat moss in them. And I'd hoped it was large enough, and it may be just. And these I will take in. I have a cool bedroom uh, that we don't heat unless we have guests. And I'm going to put those in. And these are the roots from the canna lily. And they, too, will be stored in here. Uh, I want to spread them out so that they'll dry. And I have each one of the eyes on this is a separate plant. So we'll divide them. Both of them come spring, but they will stay in, and I'll have enough cannas here to actually share with other people as well. I may need to get another box to contain all of the starts. I'll check them occasionally in the winter to see that they don't completely dry out, but mostly they will just sit any place that it's frost free. and. They will wait for spring when you can either plant them in pots inside or wait until after the last chance of frost and plant them outside. I think I have enough for a whole row here in the garden. And uh, we also had some in flower pots last year. They were blooming up until a week ago. And then the frost took them and I was able to dig it out. I think that's one of the larger sets there. So that's what we do to preserve some of the plants so that you don't have to keep buying them every year uh, if you can save them over inside. In a warmer climate, both of these would continue to grow outside, but you'd have to get down probably South Carolina or Georgia before they would be dependably uh, able to withstand the weather conditions, certainly not in New England. Okay, let's move down to the shade garden. Down in the shade garden, we still have some uh, greenery. We've got Le Calpe, at Again, this is another one we can cut for winter decorations, both inside and out. It's a green plant that stays green all winter, and it uh, is nice to cut. So if you need a little greenery, if you have a few flowers and need some greenery, Le Calpe will work well. The hellebores are still green, and they're forming their buds because, remember, they will be early to bloom. Several of the ferns will stay green a little while longer. The uh, painted fern, Japanese painted fern, has already melted with the frost and been removed from the garden for the most part. I've added some mulch in spots where there had been some washouts and the roots were showing of some of the plants, so we added a little mulch around those. I've taken out my hosta plants. We had some trouble with slugs on the hostas this year. Uh, we had a wet season, and that brought out more slugs. And they will lay their eggs, and they will winter over. So one of the things you can do is make sure all the foliage is removed from the garden, and also that you've opened up some area around the hosta, and perhaps some of the uh, slugs will be killed by the weather conditions. At least that's the, dis the uh, desirable thing that you'd like. But try not to leave the hosta foliage around and a lot of weeds around it. Some of the grasses also will stay green, the carex. And again, a little mulch. I've got a few bulbs under here. The pond was netted while the leaves were falling. It helped keep a lot of leaves out of the pond. Uh, if you had uh, fish, you would stop feeding them at this point. When the water temperature drops below 50, you would stop feeding fish. Uh, they go into kind of a suspended animation for the winter. As long as you are somehow able to keep a hole in the ice, the fish will be just fine. I usually have an ice melter. Since I don't have any fish in the pond at this time, the ice melter will not be used this year. You can also use an aeration system that will keep the water circulating and again keep a hole in the ice. We did have ice on here until today uh, after our freeze the other night. Again, I left take the net off because I find that if you leave it on over the winter it will help keep things out of the pond, but invariably the snow mats the net down and you end up with kind of a frozen mess come spring. So I've decided 
to just take it off and then I'll have to scoop out the pond in the spring and bring it back up. All of the equipment, the uh, waterfall, the skimmer, all of the tubing and the pump have all been taken in for the winter. I leave them inside, uh, otherwise they tend to get very brittle and because they're made of plastic material they will break. The pump needs to be kept in water so that's left in a bucket, uh, not turned on of course but just uh, covered with water so that the seals will stay good and it will continue to work for me next spring. I put it behind the furnace and in a bucket of water, check the bucket every once in a while to make sure the water is still there. I figure at most it can add a little humidity to the air inside. I've closed up the shed. The shed is pretty full because I've put patio furniture in there, decorative items, anything else from the garden that I want to keep undercover. The scarecrow lives in there this season. If anybody looks in the back window, they'll see a scarecrow instead of a person. Uh, it does warm up in here quite nicely on sunny days because of the glass side. Today we don't have much sun, but it's gotten up to 70 or 80 degrees inside during the day when it's 40 or 30, even 30 outdoors which means I can continue to work in there, maybe decorating a few wreaths or putting together some swags uh, without having to do them inside. Been feeding the birds like crazy. They have been very hungry. Uh, there should be still some berries and seeds outside on the plants, but they prefer to get seed from the feeder at this point now that I've put them out. Another winterization thing I've done is I have a rosemary over here and I use a cellar window, plastic cellar window, and I'm going to tuck the rosemary underneath it as much as I possibly can. We'll lose a few top shoots probably. And then I'm going to hold it down with bricks. I put another one on it too. This makes a little mini greenhouse. Snug it right in there next to the house. And so far I've been had really good luck keeping rosemary over the winter by doing this. Again, we want to get it way back there. It heats up in the uh, during the day. I have some spring bulbs planted in there. They will bloom extremely early. I may cut a little of this top rosemary off that sticks out. But the idea is to keep it snugged up against the house and make a little greenhouse. You could probably keep over some other moderately tender plants. Rosemary is okay until the temperature drops below about 20 degrees for an extended time. So it's not quite hardy in our climate. Some plants are hardier than others. But this has worked for me. This gets a southern exposure of sun, so it does get a good bit of sun. It also is kind of protected in this corner. So it's one way to try to keep some rosemary outside. As insurance, I dug the one up that was in the herb garden, and that's sitting in my front entry in a flower pot. So that one probably won't make it also. Uh, they like it cooler than your normal house temperature, which is why it's in my unheated front entry. If the temperature in that front entry goes below 20, I will be bringing it in. I also have a tender lavender out in that area. And at times I've had my fig in that area as well. This year I decided to put the fig in the garage next to the house. And it should be okay there. It'll get some heat from the house coming through the wall. And it is in a very protected spot and out of the wind. It's one of the hardier figs, a uh, brown turkey fig and it should leaf out again in the spring. Now let's go inside and do some cooking. Get ready for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's on its way, and I'm going to make a centerpiece that could be used for Thanksgiving. Now, obviously, you'd want to make this closer to Thanksgiving, and I'm going to use some of the things from my yard, some of the things from the florist, and some of the things from the grocery store. I have this cornucopia basket. Cornucopia means uh, bountiful. It's a thank, kind of a Thanksgiving symbol. And this is a little cornucopia basket. It's cone-shaped. 
and I've put a piece of floral foam in it. I have not put water in it though because I really don't want water all over the glass tray that's underneath it when it's sitting on the table. But I'm going to add some things around it and in it and I'm going to start with some broom corn and this is the broom corn that I grew out by the garden again specifically for a fall decoration and I kind of want to cover some of the edges here and then we'll start putting some things into the cornucopia and I'm going to use skewers one of the things we want to add is some uh, fruit and I'm just going to use uh, skewers to hold it down and I've got a, uh, an apple and a Bosque pear and let's put in we can also set things around it and uh, you can some people use a glue with it I prefer not to because I'd like to eat the fruit this is a Granny Smith apple and I can tuck that in Oh, I think I want another pair over here, maybe sitting down like that. Just a few pieces, and uh, I have a little pumpkin here. That'll add some color. And then we'll put some uh, fall leaves in here and there around the base. These are uh, some nice red leaves from the uh, oak leaf hydrangea. They turn a lovely fall color. I'll slip a couple of those under the, some of the fruit. And I've got plenty of fruit. I've uh, also got a dried hydrangea from the hydrangea bush. We can put that around the cornucopia. And then we're going to finish it off with some live flowers and some grapes. And the grapes can just be kind of nestled in here and there, and perhaps a bunch over this way. Again, uh, some of the directions you see for these things use glue or adhesive dots, but I would prefer to have the fruit available to be eaten, so I use skewers instead. And that one came loose. There we are. Autumn leaves also work, uh, any type of flowers you have. And for the flowers, since I don't have any, uh, anything in the foam, I'm going to use these flower holders. And these are available through a florist. And I'm just going to tuck those into the foam. Maybe another bunch of grapes here on top. You can just uh, kind of work with the design and take some of the leaves off these flowers and I have a few of the floral pins they can just go into the basket or wherever wherever they fit they do have water in them so your flowers will hold up a bit longer Get that one back a little way so you can see some of the fruit and I think that's pretty much all we need uh, again, uh, this is a little squash that can be tucked in. And the idea is to have a bowl of plenty, and we seem to have that. And so that can go on our Thanksgiving table. Another leaf over on this side be good. And we have a little Thanksgiving centerpiece. This would look nice on a buffet where you could see the side of the arrangement as well and see that it is indeed a cornucopia. Straight on, it doesn't quite look like it, but you can see the basket a little better this way. And you can continue to rearrange the grapes however they fit. But a few flowers, a few grapes, and uh, you can rearrange it, add more fruit. Uh, you might want to add another apple tucked in here once I get it on the table. It's kind of all balanced together, so we have a, a showing the abundance of fall and we don't want to see that foam underneath so we cover it up with 
some of the leaves and flowers. I've got one more leaf here that I'm going to poke in the middle. And there's our centerpiece for our fall table. Now we need something else to go on the fall table, and that's food. And I'm going to cook today a few Thanksgiving side dishes. We're going to make a few side dishes for Thanksgiving. Uh, most people have turkey, ham, or some large meat main dish, or a vegetarian main dish. But these are some side dishes made with some of the fall vegetables. And I'm going to start out by roasting the vegetables for this one. And I'm going to add a tablespoon of olive oil and a good shake or two of salt and pepper to Brussels sprouts that have been washed and halved. Might need even a little more of the olive oil. I actually think we will. I think I have a few more than a cup and a half. So I'll add about two tablespoons of olive oil. You just want to get a little coating on them. I've also put some on the pan. And then I'll spread these out on the pan and try to make an even layer on half the pan. Because on the other half of the pan, we're going to put some butternut squash and roast it. As you probably have gathered, I'm a real fan of roasted vegetables. I really like the way roasting brings out the flavor. You don't have a you have some healthy olive oil usually with it, but not a lot of fat and not a lot of sauce generally. And again, I'm going to add some olive oil, about a tablespoon and a half. Then I'm going to add some maple syrup to the squash. And again, I'm going to add about a tablespoon and a half of maple syrup. and a quarter of a cup of cinnamon. And we'll stir that around. Try to get it evenly mixed in with the squash. And fill the other side of the pan. If you were making a larger quantity, of course, you'd need to do two pans. I always, when I roast the vegetables, use foil in the pan. Makes cleanup a real breeze. You really don't have to do too much. Now we'll put this in a 400 degree oven for about 20 to 25 minutes. Set the timer for 20, and then we can uh, stir it a little bit if necessary uh, and turn it shortly before it's finished. Now I'm going to move over here and make uh, a decoration for the dessert. All right, I'm going to make a decoration to put on a Thanksgiving pie. Now the pie can be one you've made. This is going to go on a pumpkin pie. It can be one you've made or one you've bought or one you've partially made, but uh, Again, I'm using some pie crust, and I'm going to roll this out really thin. And I use a canvas and a stockinette rolling pin cover. This one's got a hole in it, but they wash nicely, and they make rolling things out really simple. I have a number of different ones, and I always keep a couple of them in the drawer. And again, I'm rolling out the pastry, and this could be pastry you've purchased or pastry you've made yourself. It doesn't make any difference. I'm going to use a canister lid. I want about a five inch circle. So whatever you have that's five inches, it might be a cereal bowl or a canister lid. But I'm making a five inch circle. I'm going to put that on my pan. Move down a little bit here. And I'm going to make a turkey. And I want to make another five inch circle. Just mark it. I'm not going to really cut it, but I'll just mark it. Because I want to make a head for the turkey. 
And I'm just going to make a circular, kind of a little circular piece. And we'll get his head ready. Right here. It will all come together at the end. I need to cut a long piece. This will be his, the wattles. And then a triangular piece for a beak. And we'll just cut a piece over here. And I have some water that I'm going to use for glue. And I'll glue the beak on. And then the wattles kind of go on top of it. And again, using a wet, moistened finger, I can put that on. And that will be his face. And then I will use a toothpick, which I had here somewhere. I may need to get another one. And I'll make a couple little eyes, just little holes for eyes. And that's going to be our turkey's head. But then we need some feathers. And I happen to have some cutters that I bought in a set. But you could also make a cardboard pattern, kind of this shape. And we're going to cut a bunch of feathers, about six. And I want to use a butter knife to just score a little feathery pattern in each one. And to get kind of a placement, I'm going to just score this circle into pieces. And we'll be putting his head in one of the areas. So we'll do that. And again, a little water will help it stay. And you see how it fits right in because we did base it on the circle. And then I'm going to be putting the wings out, the, the feathers. our little turkey and it's going to get baked at 400 degrees and you need to watch it because as you might suspect these uh, wing tips are going to get brown before the rest of it. So a solution for that are some strips of foil that you put over the wing tips wherever necessary and that will keep your uh, turkey from getting too brown on the edges and not brown at all in the middle. And I'll put that in the oven for at 450 for about 10 minutes, but uh, you need to watch it carefully. Turn on your oven light and stay nearby and time out a couple minutes at a time so that you're sure to get it out just at the right time. Now we've got pastry left. I'm not one to waste it, so I'm going to stack it. Uh, if you have any type of pastry like this, biscuits or pie pastry that's left over. Of course, you could make this from that that was left over from doing the pie in the first place. But uh, stack it rather than uh, just balling it up in a ball. And it will stay flakier that way because you're kind of building in some layers. I'm going to roll this out thin again.
And I'm going to use my cutter to make uh, some pastry for some potato and onion pies, which we'll fill in a little while. And I'm just going to cut circles, as many as I can. Incidentally, any leftover pastry, the birds love. You can put it in your suet feeder and they'll be very happy about it. It has just the right combination of grain and fat that they like. And I'm going to use this to fill tart shells. No need to grease them. The pastry will come out. We're going to be putting a mixture in them a little later. And just put them in. This is a really simple dish, but uh, everybody seems to like it. So the only hard part is again filling the pastry into the pans, but that's not too hard really. Okay, so we've done that, and I'm going to put these over by the stove, where we'll be filling them a little later. And anything that's left, again, the birds will love it. I'll just put it into my suet feeder, and they will have it gone in no time. The next thing I want to put together are some biscuits. And I've already started by uh, working a quarter cup of butter into the flour. And I'm going to add one and a half teaspoons of baking powder and some salt and let's see how much of this I want. Uh, about a half teaspoon or a quarter teaspoon of pumpkin pie spice. I'm also going to add a quarter cup plus two tablespoons of shredded cheddar cheese and mix that in well. And then I'll add a half a cup of canned pumpkin. This is the just plain canned pumpkin. It doesn't have anything in it but the pumpkin which may be squash, given the uh, recent news that I heard that some of the pumpkin that they can has squash in it, but it's all good stuff. And I'll mix that in. And we'll also probably need some milk. These are a little more savory biscuit item. You'll notice they don't have any sugar in them, so that's good. But they do have a little spice. And any sweetness in the dough comes just from the natural pumpkin. And I need to add one or two tablespoons of milk. I just want a soft dough, so it's not going to take too much. Remember, there is a quarter cup of butter that's been cut in. And just a little bit more milk. When you're baking, uh, in the winter particularly, the humidity in the house can vary quite a bit. And if it's really dry, you'll need to add a little more milk than if the house is humid. Okay, and we'll put a little flour, more flour on the board. And I'll turn out this dough. And kind of pat it together. And I want to make this into about an 8 inch circle. And I can kind of pat the edges around to make the circle. And these are going to be turkey shaped biscuits. You can do the shaping with any type of dough. 
you would follow your recipe for the baking part. It works with uh, the uh, purchased dough for French bread. That was the original recipe for this shaping, but I decided I wanted biscuits instead. Now I'm going to cut it in wedges. And I'll cut eight wedges. I'm going to use a mini muffin pan. And we'll use every other one and put the point facing out. So we're going to be able to get six in this pan. This is going to be the beak that comes out over the edge. And the tail is behind. And poke some of it down in. And I have two left, which means a second muffin pan. And I did not grease the pan. Oh. Counting on the amount of butter that's in the biscuit itself. If you grease it, you would have to grease every other one. And I didn't bother. And I'm going to cut tail feathers with uh, my kitchen scissors, clean kitchen scissors. And spread them out a little bit. And then these are going to go into a 400 degree oven. And they'll take probably about 10 to 15 minutes to bake. Now we're going to make a filling to put in the little tart shells that we did. And this is a savory dish, a side dish. Very good with turkey, chicken, ham. Particularly nice with ham. It's a good brunch dish. It's a good dinner dish. It's even a good snack. Uh, they're called potato and onion pies. And I've sliced thinly a potato. Uh, my original recipe made 24 and uses about three potatoes. And I'm going to drain those. I've had them in water. If you have to cut up potatoes ahead, even if you're peeling them and putting them ready for mash, mashing potatoes for Thanksgiving, put them in water so that they don't turn brown. And I've also thinly sliced about half an onion and I'm melting butter here and I'm going to add the potatoes and the onion and then we're just going to let it cook until it gets a little bit brown. Along the way I'm going to add salt and pepper and that's all it is, fried potatoes. Pretty simple dish, fried potatoes and onions and then we're going to put it in the shells and stick them in the oven. Okay, it's been about five or six minutes, and now my potatoes are just starting to be completely cooked. The onions have all wilted, but they haven't really browned too much, and it's just the way we want it. And now I'm going to put potatoes and onions into each of the tarts. You want to get some of each in each one, and just kind of divide it, whatever you have. goes into the same uh, 400 degree oven and we're going to cook those for approximately 35 minutes. And while we're here, conveniently our squash and Brussels sprouts are finished. And I want to set these down and bring my bowl over. We're going to finish this dish by just scooping everything into a bowl. We're going to mix them now that they're all baked. Uh, 
Again, if the pan is a snap to clean up, you just remove the foil and it's finished. Well, we're going to add to this about a half a cup of pecans. And I like to uh, toast the pecans in a 350 oven for about five minutes. Uh, you don't want to burn them. They burn quite easily, so you do have to watch them. But they taste so much better when they've been toasted. And I also added then a half a cup of dried cranberries. So there you have it. It's a warm salad or hot dish or vegetable dish. The original recipe called it a salad, but I think it's more like a, a vegetable dish. And we can take that to the table, and then we'll get out some other things to take to the table too. Let's fix our pie for dessert. We need to put our turkey on top. And you'll see how he came out nicely browned. And I'm just going to plunk him down in the middle of the pie on the edge there. Broke off a wing tip. So that gives our pie a little special hint. And I'll take that into the dining room as well. Now we need to get out our little turkey rolls and the potato pies. And before I take them to the table, I do want to add some parsley to the top of the potato pies. You can see how nicely browned they are with the uh, onions caramelized a bit. I'm going to add some parsley, and this came from the garden. I've chopped it. It makes a real nice garnish for the potato pies. Tasty, too. You could use uh, some of the green onion. Uh, they're also good with sour cream if you want a little something along the side, or even some yogurt. I've picked a lot of the parsley from the garden and put it into glass jars. I washed it and drained it slightly, but I left some of the moisture on the parsley. This is an old canning jar. I can't use it any longer because, uh, unfortunately, they don't make the little rubber rings anymore to go on them, so I wouldn't be using it for canning, but it works really well for the refrigerator. And the parsley will stay in the glass. If you put it in plastic, it tends to wilt and rot very quickly, but in the glass, it will stay good. I will be able to use this parsley probably until around Christmas, which is over five weeks away. Now let's put our items on the table. So we have some side dishes for Thanksgiving, uh, some turkey-shaped rolls. You can see they came out kind of like little birds. Uh, may take a little stretch of the imagination, but they're a little different anyway. Uh, potato and onion pies go with just about anything. Our broccoli, our Brussels sprout, and butternut squash salad, or hot dish, whichever you prefer. I prefer to serve it warm. I think it's intended to be served warm, not cold. And then on each napkin, you'll notice I've placed a leaf and just a little candy pumpkin, just to make it a little special for a, a holiday menu. And we have our cornucopia centerpiece, which if anybody wants a piece of fruit, it's there for them to take. I'm Liz Davey, and I'm wishing you all a happy Thanksgiving. I know I'm thankful to NCTV, who films this show, for filming the show and allowing me to share my garden with all of you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you.